so I'll tell you a story which is probably the least related to liquid crystals, even though it's still motivated to some extent. And um, so it's joint work. It started with uh, Valeri uh, probably some, quite some years ago, and then slowly developed uh, some later pieces. Uh, hopefully, I'll get to them. Um, uh, a joint with uh, Jen Feizu, who's a postdoc uh, at uh, our mathematics department, and uh, with Sundar Sudaraman, who's my colleague also at our mathematics department. Okay, so uh, in the spirit of uh, every other theoretician in this room, I'm going to lift uh, one of the uh, pictures from Oleg's group. Uh, and, uh, so that was our original motivation. So the motivation was to uh, study uh, chromonic liquid crystals. And um, in particular, as you know, uh, Valeria and I, we um, worked on some uh, Onzager type theories for pneumatics. And uh, the original idea was to apply something like that to chromonics. And, um, <laughs> So it didn't quite, we didn't quite manage to do it to the level of rigor we wanted to. So instead, we said, OK, if we cannot develop an Anzager-like theory, which would include the distribution of your uh, rod-like structures with respect to uh, orientations and uh, sizes, let's try just to do the sizes. And that's how it started. So in the end, there is a motivation that you have some sort of a process. And um, as a result, you get some uh, probability density. However, there's no orientation. There's only sizes. So it's a rather abstract formulation. So let's, um, by the way, let me ask you to ask questions whenever you want, because especially um, this is a little bit of the regular PDE track, so if things are not clear, uh, please ask. I'll try to explain before everybody gets completely lost. Uh, so generally speaking, it's an aggregation process in an abstract formulation, and uh, you can, under various guises, call it clustering, coagulation, polymerization. I personally like use the language of polymers. So, And the idea is that you have a bunch of monomers, like here, and then they somehow stick together, and you get a bunch of polymers. You can also think of this, I don't know, as water molecules, and this would be water droplets or fog droplets. Uh, however, you probably want, uh, in this case, some sort of a statistical ensemble, so we'll get to that a bit later. Uh, so let's do a little bit of notation. So once we have a bunch of monomers and they stick to polymers, so this particular configuration can be characterized by a bunch of numbers, pk. So that's the number of polymers containing exactly k monomers, all right? So here we have uh, four single monomer polymers, two uh, double monomer, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, uh, the question is, in the end, as m, the number of monomers, tends to infinity, can we get some sort of a behavior of uh, number of polymers? And so that's how it is. And uh, so let me tell you a little bit about uh, uh, here is where math starts appearing, and uh, which doesn't necessarily have a direct relationship to physics. Uh, however, there's still physical analogy. So I like calling uh, some systems classical and some systems quantum, even though they're not necessarily related to quantum or uh, classical physics at all. So if you think of uh, monomers, which you can't actually distinguish, like here, then you can say it's a quantum ensemble if you want. And uh, if you can actually distinguish the monomers, like here it's a polymer of size 3 and polymers of, of size 1, but you see, if all of them are distinguishable, there's different ways, of course, to group them. And uh, so there will be additional combinatorial factors. So for each particular set of PKs, right, so if you have indistinguishable monomers, you have exactly one configuration. Uh, it is equivalent to prescribe how many uh, polymers of size k you have to uh, having a partition of monomers into polymers. However, if you have distinguishable monomers, you're going to have this extra combinatorial factor, which is simply just a multinomial distribution, m factorial over k factorial to power pk, because we have pk polymers of size k. So uh, that's that part. And then the polymers themselves are indistinguishable, so that's why you have pk factorial. Uh, yeah, so it's uh, 
in the end, a little bit later, uh, you'll see that the quantum monomers are going to be related to, uh, so to uh, geometric random variables and classical to Poisson random variables, and uh, kind of because of this factor. And then uh, here we, we're talking about partitions of integers because say four is equal to three plus one. Uh, and here we have partitions of sets, because a set of four elements, where elements are distinguishable, uh, could be partitioned in several, uh, separate different ways. Uh, so that's another illustration, and uh, yet another mathematical language which is associated with all of this. Uh, I'm just giving you some sort of a partition of, in this case, number 15. It's your polymeric system. And there is a kind of a more abstract version in mathematical language, which is a Young diagram associated with it. Uh, it's okay. Let's, if you assume that all these polymers are kind of linear structures, and you stack them in a corner, um, so then they're going to form what's called the Young diagram. And so here is uh, P4 is equal to one. So the longest polymer is in the bottom. Then we have P3 is one. Then there is two P2s, uh, size two, and then four size uh, one polymers in the end. So that's the language which is kind of useful for thinking about this. Uh, type of systems. And uh, so now to decipher the title of the talk, uh, what are the limit shapes? So the limit shapes are the shapes of these diagrams, which you will observe if you look at them from very, very far. Or in other words, you can make the sizes of those squares much smaller. And as you increase it here, I just drew some kind of random things. Uh, so m equals to 6, 24, 96, 384. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, there's a variety of Young diagrams, so what does it mean? Uh, a typical Young diagram, that will correspond to uh, prescribing certain measure, certain probability measure. Uh, it can be prescribed either on the sequences PK, it could be prescribed on partitions of integers, it could be prescribed on Young diagrams. These all uh, objects are sort of equivalent. And uh, so the polymer size density function will be related to this limiting function uh, uh, pretty much directly. So this is, will be a distribution of sizes, and uh, uh, rho of x will be its derivative. I'll, see you. I'll show you this in a second. So again, so we're kind of reviewing everything. Polymers, uh, monomers, polymers, Young diagrams, and then uh, finally the size distribution function. So here is a, another uh, example where it, it's, you, you should try to spend a few seconds looking at it and understanding it. So if you look at the top of these Young diagrams, so the uh, shelves, they form piecewise uh, continuous function, and this function is actually just that. So it's sum for k greater than or equal to x, uh, sum of pk's. So it's number of polymers whose size is greater than x, and that's exactly what it is. So if you think here, so if, if you go further than five, there's nothing, then once you uh, go down five, there is one polymer, and then once you go below size two, uh, size three, there's two polymers, you go, uh, so et cetera, et cetera. So that's uh, pretty much your size uh, distribution function. So that's why in the previous slide, so once you take a limit of that thing, uh, its derivative is the density of sizes, so probability density of, for polymer to have certain size. And, uh, you know, that's how sort of the theory here, you see we get some, we'll get some distribution of sizes, but we won't have any distributions of orientations yet, so it's, it's a subject for future work here. So, of course, what does it mean to uh, get that limit, so limit shape? How do we go to this uh, large number of monomers limit or small square limit. Well, first of all, let's uh, divide this f, little f, by m. So what does it do? So if you think of it, the integral of this function from 0 to infinity is exactly m, the number of squares, yeah? Because if the size is 1, so the integral will give you number of squares. So dividing by number of squares, we'll get uh, size distribution function, which integrates to 1. And then lambda is some parameter, which you can modify so that in the limit, something makes sense. Something doesn't go all the way to zero or doesn't uh, explode. Uh, so you can think of lambda as the horizontal scaling, and you can think of lambda over m as vertical scaling, in a way, right? Because that's your 
uh, how you scale f in vertical direction, lambda over m, and lambda x is the horizontal. Yeah. Any questions so far? All make sense? OK. So time to start introducing measures. And of course, as a, uh, if you work in statistical physics, you're uh, certainly familiar with uh, ideas of Gibbs measures. And uh, this is one of the typical ways to kind of get statistical ensembles which are considered to be relevant to physics. Uh, and in this case, we introduce Gibbs measures. So here's canonical Gibbs measures. We take all possible partitions of number m, right, or sequences uh, for which some kpk is equal to m, and uh, you put weights on every particular uh, partition. So here I'm saying probability that little p is your variable is equal to big P, and it's given in terms of big P. So it's e to minus beta h of p, Hamiltonian for that configuration. So what is this? This is simply sum of internal energies of individual polymers. So it's a system of sort of non-interacting polymers. However, monomers inside of a polymer, they do interact, and they give you this Ek, the energy of a, of a polymer of size k. And uh, you form uh, everything, and uh, so that's your statistical ensemble. It's called canonical. Uh, canonical Gibbs ensemble. Uh, in particular, so there is a comment here, so that if uh, beta is equal to zero, uh, so in other words, there's no energies, uh, so it's uh, just, uh, uh, for example, the normalizing factor is known as partition uh, uh, number of, uh, of m, right, because you're summing over all possible partitions of m, so it's just the number, because all of these things are ones, and so that's uh, quite a famous result by Ramanujan and Hardy. So it's given by that number. Um, so canonical partitions, uh, canonical measures turn out to be a little bit hard. I'll show you in a second why. Uh, so people introduce grand canonical partitions, uh, sorry, grand canonical uh, measures. And uh, these are essentially superpositions of canonical measures uh, where you now allow m to vary itself. So the number of monomers is a random variable uh, which is exponentially distributed, so there is this weight, e to the minus mu m, and mu is uh, what's called chemical potential, uh, or version of a chemical potential, uh, so which controls where the average number of monomers lies. And uh, so now you have a grand canonical partition sum, which is now not just sum of a P which partitions m, but also sum of all m's from zero to infinity. Zero is kind of an empty system, uh, so where everything is just uh, supposed to be one, yeah? And so you sum those things, and what you get is a generating function. So that's the, uh, it's a generating function of the canonical uh, partition functions. So if you, uh, that's one of the typical examples, so say in combinatorics, how they find asymptotics and formulas of this kind by uh, analyzing properties of the partition functions associated, and then, you know, kind of coefficients in Taylor expansions, uh, they give you the uh, partition functions for canonical ensembles. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the grand canonical setting. So why is that more, why is that important? Why is that uh, helpful at all? Well, that was, uh, Perhaps in this case, it was an observation by uh, Vershik, who realized, I mean, it's not a uh, hard fact, but once you see it, it kind of uh, makes things very easy, that these grand canonical measures, if you just look at it, exponential m, m itself is some kpk, Hamiltonian itself is the sum ekpk, so this can be immediately written as simply e to product of e to minus mu k plus B k p k, and uh, so that's a normalizing factor. So these are just the product measures. But what does it mean to be a product measure? Uh, as far as p k's, which are your random variables, are concerned, it just means that they're independent. Right? So in the grand canonical ensembles, probability that polymer has certain so certain number of polymers of certain size is an independent event from probability that polymers, there's a certain number of polymers of a different size. Of course, in canonical ensembles, that's not possible because you have the constraint, your m, some kpk in canonical ensembles, 
is not a random variable, so that's a constraint on PK. So these are obviously not independent random variables. Well, here they become independent. And of course, everybody likes sums of independent random variables and whatnot, so it's, uh, that's how you can actually get results. In fact, that was the sort of the abstract theorem uh, proven by Vershek, really simplified proving uh, statements like limit shapes for this kind of systems, uh, because before, uh, p people, of course, uh, will use it looking at these problems in various contexts, mostly in combinatorial contexts, and um, it wasn't as straightforward, but uh, so the major contribution here is that if you have uh, what's called concentration of measure in grand canonical ensembles, so the same thing happens in canonical ensembles. It's also kind of easy to understand, right? If your canonical measure is just a condition or restriction of grand canonical measure to M having certain value. So if grand canonical measure concentrates at a point, then its condition or restriction kind of has to concentrate at the same point unless something really degenerate happens. And so nothing degenerate really happens so that uh, so that's how you can analyze the systems. You will look at grand canonical ensembles, and from them you can get what you want. Okay. So let me tell you a little bit about what's been known in this kind of systems for a little bit. And uh, uh, so the results, as I said before, existed for measures which did not have Gibbs weights. And these type of measures, they arise from other contexts. For example, partitions of integers, right? So that's a question. You just take random partitions of integers and let all of them be completely equiprobable. So there is no difference between different partitions. So what is the size of a summand in such a partition? And that's the question, right? So that's. Uh, that's related to measure being just like that, you see, so this is the grand canonical version, so there is just, there is no Hamiltonian. Uh, you can uh, uh, calculate everything what's needed, and that was the result which was proven by Vershik by uh, using this kind of equivalence. Even though there were uh, people found these kind of formulas by completely different means with a very complicated math, this is much simpler uh, when it's done that way. So you can also get the scaling that is about square root of expected number of monomers. And uh, or this, the correspondence between canonical and grand canonical is really the expected number of monomers is equal to the number of monomers in canonical ensemble. And uh, so this is a famous uh, Vershik curve. So uh, the size distribution function itself is an integral from x to infinity. And so what's inside is the density. So it's uh, actually it's given by, so maybe I should, so let me see. Do we have a chalk anywhere? Ah, there. So, so if you, this is really, if you integrate it, of course, you can get the logarithm of that thing. So you can get something like this. So e to the minus x plus e to the minus y is equal to 1. Uh, this, uh, this square root of uh, 6 and pi there, only uh, they, you can scale them out. But it's a curve which looks like that. And that's your f of x. So this is y. This is x. So it's a nice symmetric curve. And that was quite a big uh, result. So that uh, you have this kind of limit shape for partitions of uh, integers. Now, uh, for classical monomers, uh, you have this additional combinatorial factor. So in addition to this minus mu m of p, so there is this uh, now that exact factor that I mentioned before. So if you take a now uniform measure on partitions of sets rather than partitions of integers, so that's this extra factor you're going to get, um, as I uh, discussed before. And uh, so the result was obtained by Yuri Yakubovich which I believe was Vershik student. Um, and uh, it actually gives you step function. So in fact, that is something that is much more similar to what you see in classical polymers. Uh, if you have a polymerization process, so under certain conditions, you will get pretty much polymers of similar size. And there is some sort of Gaussian distribution of around the average size. And that's um, 
So this, the point where you have, so here is one is obtained by, again, picking correct scaling, and you can actually zoom in and get some theorems about um, uh, kind of shape of the step function when you get a slightly different scaling about it. So that's the uh, classical monomers case, and there's a couple more worth mentioning. So one is the, uh, this, uh, uh, plus on Dirichlet measures, uh, hard statistics on uh, uh, symmetric groups. So in fact, this was one of the original uh, problems where these kind of things appeared. So what if you take a random permutation, a random symmetric group, uh, so sorry, uh, take a symmetric group and take a random member of a symmetric group. So there is a cycle structure, right? So every permutation has a cycle structure and that gives you mapping from symmetric group to partitions of integers because cycle of certain length corresponds to sum and of certain size. Now, the only difference between this and the partition of sets is that instead of k factorial to power of pk, here we have k to power of pk, but it's also not hard to understand why. It's first you kind of take a set and you make a partition of a set, but then once you have a subset uh, in the, your partition, you want to make like a cycle out of it, and there's k minus one uh, factorials ways to do a cycle. So that's if it's like for each way for the partition of sets, there will be k minus one factorial ways to then arrange them to make uh, a cycle, and uh, so that's k minus one and k uh, uh, factorials cancel, and you just get k to the power of pk. So in that case, it turns out there is no limit shape, and in fact, uh, there is again a, I didn't uh, quote it here, but there is a big paper by uh, Vershik and Schmidt, actually two papers, which uh, analyze this measure. It's kind of a measure on infinite dimensional simplex. Um, and their interest was a representation theory of, of symmetric groups, and they wanted to find some invariance. So what, what, what happens when you take the order of symmetric group to infinity? And um, so that's related to that. So there is a, uh, there is no limit, uh, so limit shape, but there is uh, some kind of a limit process, and um, you get uh, statistics for larger cycle, and uh, which is related to also by Einstein condensation. So if you might have seen that there, and so okay, there is last measure which I mentioned, but I don't uh, even show you example because you need to do some more uh, kind of Fermat math to do it. It's a measure on Pl Plancherov measure, which is probably kind of another one very interesting, it's a measure on characters of, again, symmetric group. It's another one of the kind of measures which appear in representation theory. So it also has an explicit limit shape, uh, but it's a little harder to mention. So, okay, so here's where uh, Valeria and I pretty much uh, took over. <laughs> so uh, we said, all right, so let's add this uh, EKs, the Gibbs measures, and somehow because the People who did the, all the work before us, they weren't interested in physics applications, so they were looking at different classes of measures. They didn't quite look at what happens when you add this stuff. And so there's a different motivation. So what kind of EKs would one want to look at? So here is this back relation to your chrom uh, chromonic liquid crystals or maybe to droplets. Uh, and if you think, so this is one of those, uh, this is pretty much surface energy, right? If you think, of k, po polymer of size k, uh, k as a mass, then if it's a droplet in d dimensions, then the surface area would be proportional to k to power d minus 1 over d. Right? Because k to power 1 over d is the radius, and then to power d minus 1, that's the surface area. Uh, so that kind of gives you the correspondence. In, in particular, if it's chromonic, so then it's kind of one, one dimensional, you just get e k uh, something like 1. Uh, of course, it's because the energy penalty pretty much comes from the sides when the chromonic liquid crystals has a you know, hydrophobic side and it doesn't like you know, being next to water. Or perhaps you could have something proportional to logarithm k, not quite constant because there's always fluctuations and um, you can argue that this formula is still rather vaguely connected to uh, real physics, but... Um, Perhaps these kind of things are interesting to understand. Okay, and uh, so what we found, uh, 
after you know some years of uh, work and uh, procrastination uh, that there's five regimes in this particular case. So in, in uh, quantum monomer. So Valeria and I, we put these measures on top of the background measure, uniform measure on partitions of integers, and then you put Gibbs weights on it. So let me briefly walk you through the results, and then towards the end, I'll start sprinting and uh, skip the slides with the explanation. So uh, if the energies are too large, in this case, greater than logarithm, asymptotically greater than logarithm, then it turns out the system simply doesn't want to create lots of <coughs> polymers. It doesn't want to invite monomers into the system. And in grand canonical ensembles, you cannot get uh, expe expected number of monomers tending to infinity. So this is one of those cases where the only way to analyze it is using canonical ensemble, and we can't do that. So that was not accomplished. But in other cases, when uh, there is case of critical growth, ek proportional to log k, and then subcritical between constant and log, and then there is a proportional to constant. Much less than constant turns out to be not interesting. That's the this Wroshik's curve. That's the classical thing. So if you take f of x is your y, take exponential, that's what you get with some uh, scaling in x and y. So uh, so these are three cases, and they're kind of uh, they're pretty interesting. So. If EK is proportional to one, and that's your uh, quantum chromonic case, whatever that means, right? So it's, uh, that's what happens. So you take that, uh, it's pretty much the Einstein distribution, if you want, and shift it a little bit. So this curve uh, in, uh, in proper scaling, which I think I maybe even give somewhere. Yes, so you, uh, the temperature, uh, beta actually enters the scaling of the cells of Young diagrams. So this thing kind of gets shifted. So and you get, so this is beta not equal to zero. So you get a shift in the distribution. And uh, so when ek between constants and log k, you simply get e to the minus x. So it's it's kind of like that, but then this sort of one becomes irrelevant. That's because of the scaling. Uh, once everything rescales, so there's some factor which just is much bigger than one. And there is, again, scaling stretching factor of the uh, uh, Young diagrams. Uh, so then there is a, another case uh, when EK is proportional to log logarithm K. And so there is actually interesting cases as well. So if you... Uh, get beta less than one, you get uh, incomplete uh, gamma function or uh, gamma distribution for your limit shape. And then beta is equal to one. It's, a, it's like critical, critical case where you do not get the limit shape. You get the limit process that actually kind of is the same limit as you get in the Bose-Einstein condensation. Actually, you get exactly the same measure. So you get limit process. It's a Poisson type process which starts at infinity. So your, your young diagrams after appropriate scaling, and if you start at x equals to infinity at, at zero, and then you make jumps, and the density of jumps uh, is exactly this quantity since it blows up at zero. Uh, you with probability one, your limit shape will tend to infinity, but it's a process. And then for beta between one and two, uh, it turns out that the variance of your limit shape, uh, of your size distribution function is too large, and there is simply no limit. And then if beta is uh, greater or equal to two, then it turns out again the grand canonical ensembles break down and you cannot invite infinitely many monomers into the system. So this is pretty much the summary of all possible limit shapes which you can get in grand canonical ensembles of this type. So that was it. Okay, so a little bit later, uh, we did the grand canonical ensembles on partitions of sets. Now, it's pretty much the same story, but now you have this extra combinatorial factor. Now. Notice that here you have this PK factorial, so when you do the product measure, so instead of geometric, you get Poisson's because there is this PK factorial. So it's just a product of, if you look at this quantity as the uh, probability for PK alone, 
this entire th factor, this one, is just something to power pk, and something is this alpha k. So you get alpha k to power pk or pk factorial, so it's a Poisson random variable. And um, so that's your sizes of uh, numbers of polymers of certain sizes become Poisson rather than geometric. So it's a little bit different calculation. Um, and uh, so you also get various results. So there's uh, uh, three asymptotic regimes, and that was uh, the work with uh, Jin Fei. So uh, there's a regime when this beta EK is asymptotically greater than minus K log K. So minus K log K, it, you know, it goes to negative infinity, so that's probably not very physical already, but anything that goes positive uh, is pretty much in this regime. Uh, any internal energies which grow is this regime. Uh, no, sorry, is this regime. So in this case, there is uh, nothing particularly interesting. It's energies go, if you less than minus K log K, the energies just go to infinity so fast that everything goes to infinity. Just every, all the systems, you create polymers infinitely, infinite length, infinitely many monomers. There's nothing particularly exciting. Uh, now, step function, the regime of step function is actually holds uh, not just for beta is equal to zero, which is pretty much just a zero energy, right, a constant energy, but in fact it's true for anything above minus k log k. And then there is the critical regime when beta e k is exactly minus k log k. In that case, well, if you look here, of course, it's not very surprising. Uh, so if you, you can kind of take this k factorial and take it from here into energies, right, and you renormalize your energy in a way. So in, introduce this little k, which is beta k plus logarithm k factorial, and so I'm writing it here. So now you can analyze what happens depending on the asymptotics of what's left, and that's this little ek. And uh, so if they are super linear, and they are at least at most as large as k log k, right? Because logarithm k factorial is k log k, and so eks would be smaller than that because uh, otherwise you'd already be in super subcritical. Uh, but if it's actually super linear, then you still go to either super, uh, subcritical or supercritical regimes. Now, there is a linear case, in which case you have a sudden swap of behavior. So if you look at these measures, so the limit is achieved when mu tends somewhere. So that's when you have infinitely many particles. And for normal cases, it achieved when mu tends to negative infinity, but Suddenly, once the uh, where am I? Yeah, once you uh, become k, e k becomes order k, smaller. Then the limit will be obtained as mu goes to a finite quantity, which can be always made zero by removing the linear part from this e k. So you take this and then remove the linear term because it simply is absorbed by that factor of minus mu k. And then there is uh, again a bunch of regimes if it's super logarithmic, then there is, uh, again, no thermodynamic limit. If it's sublogarithmic, then you get uh, your e to the minus x limit shape. And then there is a logarithmic case, which is, uh, uh, again, more interesting. And so some of uh, this result, so for if you have ek asymptotically equivalent to p logarithm k for p greater than minus 1, that's what you get, the same incomplete gamma. Uh, distribution, which was also obtained by Erlson Gronowski, but for exactly uh, exactly that value, not for asymptotically equivalent. They used completely different method, and it was sort of important that it's exactly P or K. And uh, so, if E K is uh, something like minus log K, then you get, again get your limit process e to the minus x over x. And uh, if you get p less than minus one, there is again variance becomes infinite. So these are the pretty much uh, together these two um, settings. So these two works provide a complete characterization of all possible limit shapes which you can get on uh, in grand canonical ensembles, whether it's classical or quantum or partitions of sets or integers. So that's uh, pretty much it. So let me maybe tell you a little bit of how it works. I have a couple slides, so I don't even have to skip them. So uh, it's actually quite simple, simple calculation. In fact, it's uh, uh, kind of embarrassing how simple it is, because 
pro most likely people never did it because they never looked at it. Uh, but the limit shape itself is given by the limit of the expectation of the size distribution function, right? So that's your f lambda. So we just take a expectation, take a we need to take a limit when your mu tends to whatever limit. So in this case, I, I wrote it for a uh, case of the, okay, so ek log k, right? So let's look at this case. So if you, uh, so if you take expectation, it's a geometric random variable. So expectation, you just take it. It's, you know, you can find it in Wikipedia. And then uh, expectation of m of p is also, it's a sum. And then le let's look at this sum. So you have this parameter mu, and mu will tend to zero. Uh, so if you just do a little bit of reshuffling, you have mu k here. Um, you pull out mu to power beta, mu k, mu mu, uh, mu to two minus beta. And then as mu tends to zero, if you look at this closely now, then mu k becomes x. And this is your dx. This is x, x to power beta, you know, e to the x minus, uh, uh, well, that disappears, right? So, and that's how you get it. So this is pretty much the entire integral would be gamma two minus beta, and then the, the rest will be, so this will converge to that incomplete gamma function. So that's, although only half a story, right? Because this gives you expectation of the limit shape, but it doesn't prove you that there is concentration phenomena. For that, you just need to do a little bit of work, which is pretty much the same. So you first you say, okay, by Kolmogorov inequality, this is where uh, Vershik's idea to replace canonical with grand canonical is important, because in grand canonical, it's independent random variables, and you can use Kolmogorov inequality to estimate probabilities of their sums, right? So this is just quantity of sum of independent random variables. You have supremum of deviation from the average is given by the variance. So you just look at the variance, and uh, uh, it's a little bit more complicated, but again, it converges to some integral, and so you can obtain results, like I showed you, that when beta is less than one, this is a finite integral, finite quantity, so you get variance converges to zero, um, and uh, average converges to that quantity, which gives you the limit shape statement. That's pretty much all there is. And uh, it's, it's reasonably similar techniques uh, to do partitions of sets and integers. You just convert various sums into integrals and uh, analyze their convergence. Okay, and okay, maybe I'll, I'll just give you a little bit of taste of other results that I did with Sundar and uh, Jenfei. So, uh, there is a dynamical process, right? So you can think of this system as uh, uh, kind of a dynamical systems where you have your polymers, deta monomers detaching and attaching. And uh, in terms of Young diagrams, you can add or erase cells in the corner with some probabilities. Uh, in terms of, uh, then you can rewrite this in terms of particles. Usually, so there is like four uh, particle size one, two particle size two, particle size three, particle size four. So you can make particles hop from place to place. That's the same as attaching or erasing the corners of Young diagram. So that's kind of correspondence to the particle system. And uh, you can create some sort of rates based on, uh, uh, in the end, of course, it's based on what you can do. And you can justify, you know, maybe that there is some physics to these rates, uh, sort of some sort of a uh, energy barrier. Uh, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not 100 percent certain that that's the best justification. So that's actually one of those projects for the future to look at a more interesting diagram. And so what you, what you get, you get a, uh, a PDE governing this uh, this raw. The, so if you if you do this scale, rescaling of space. Uh, like one over mu, that's the same rescaling that was done to get those limit shapes. And then you speed up the time uh, in the diffusive scaling, then you can get those, this f, the, and uh, so this size distribution functions or its derivative uh, it becomes a solution of certain PDE. And so this was the uh, first we were interested in, so Funaki and Sasada, they had the results specifically for Vershik's, uh, Vershik's curve, so for uniform, uh, for ensemble of geometric random variables which corresponds to Vershik's uh, distribution. And uh, so we again, we generalized it for EKs, uh, where your hopping rates now depends on these energies. And you get, in addition to the previous cases, you get a couple other uh, 
limiting PDEs, uh, so which kind of describe the dynamics of this sort of if you start with a system which is not in equilibrium state, not in the limit shape, but somewhere else, so that PDE will describe how that shape converges to the limit shape. So, and uh, okay, so I'm pretty much done. Uh, what are the questions to study? So certainly fluctuations is uh, rather interesting. Uh, then hydrodynamic limits for classical polymers, as I explained, uh, this is something more perhaps relevant to real physics. Most of polymeric physics models, when you start reading, there will be Poisson distributions, not geometric, even though I managed to find a couple where this seems to be geometric. Uh, uh, and then large deviations. In fact, this was something that Val and I started thinking about because uh, uh, in the very beginning, because large deviations give you the free energy function, all right? So that's the, in, in probabilistic language, when you look at large deviations uh, functional, its minimizer is the limit shape, and uh, the functional itself is the free energy for the system. And so the hope was to try to get the large deviations for orientations and size distributions, and that was not doable. I'm st I don't think it's doable even now, but at least for the size distributions, you can do large deviations. And then, of course, the add orientation. So that would give you some harmonics. But that's probably, you know, next time I see you guys in five years or so. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Time for questions. Yeah, I had a sort of vague kind of question which was connected to what you were saying at the end. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, there's a very large literature on coagulation fragmentation equations mm -hmm. where the variables are exactly the PK that you started with at the beginning, and often you're assuming conservation of numbers of particles, so some PK, some KPK is a constant. Mm -hmm. So I'll place you in this canonical ensemble and so on. And then, and then the name of the game often is to, so you prescribe rates for um, how K clusters, the rate at which K clusters meet L clusters to form K plus L clusters and how K plus L clusters, you know, disintegration to K. And, and, and corresponding to these rates, you get different asymptotic distributions, and you get all sorts of interest. So there's a huge literature on this, and yeah. I just wondered. Uh, you're you absolutely would... correct. Yeah. So it's uh, we can't do that using methods that are done in this problem, and uh, this reason is twofold. No, number one is you're correct. So this is first of all we're doing grand canonical, uh, and. Uh, so it's not a canonical, so it's not exactly the same, so we don't conserve the number of uh, particles in that sense, uh, so that's a random variable. Second of all, that is an, this is uh, like that slide with uh, particles, uh, you can understand, so the process of adding and erasing cells, that's when you add one thing at a time, uh, that's a local process in the terms of particle system. You just hop to nearest neighbor. So the fragmentation process is a highly non-local process where you can take a polymer and break it in two. And I definitely agree that it's much more relevant for something like chromonics where you would expect that these rods uh, you know, can break in the middle instead of bending. And, uh, uh, but we can't do it using the methods that were done here. I'm not, it's not to say that it cannot be done, and of course people do things like that, but uh, the techniques are pretty much more, much more local uh, in the spirit of random walk convergence. You extract kind of mean and look at the martingale part, and then uh, by local estimates you just control that heat equation type part that appears, and uh, non-locality is harder to... It's, it's like fighting in the end spectral gap in a matrix which is almost diagonal versus the matrix which is completely non-diagonal. <laughs> so. Further questions? One, yes. Can it be positive and negative? Well, okay. Uh, no, so here, so the way, okay, as I said, negative um, chemical potential here is, uh, um, is just this mu which is added to... Uh, correct. Now, for 
classical polymers, because it is a uh, tell me where is where are my classical polymers. So because it is a, a Poisson random variable, and there is this PK factorial. Uh, regardless of what value of chemical potential is, you will always have uh, an ensemble. For quantum, the geometric distribution, you do not. So for geometric distribution, that's why I'm like everywhere where I was writing uh, something of that sort. Uh, maybe I wasn't writing it anywhere. So yes, there is certain uh, number mu star, which is uh, like here, I, I'm writing mu goes to zero, but it's after kind of removing the uh, removing the linear part out of E case. So otherwise, there is certain energy, there's certain value mu star below which there's no ensembles at all, and above which there is uh, there are those ensembles. And you're interested exactly in the limit when mu goes to mu star from above. In case of uh, classical, it's going to be negative infinity, except in that supercritical regime, in ex exactly one case. Um, and then you turn it to mi minus infinity, otherwise, yeah. It's, mu star is equal to limit for E k's over k, if you, if you take it like that, so if you like, be more precise. Yeah. 